Great. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought we were just talking out in the garden area outside of the meeting house, and we thought we'd run this as an interview. Uh, I, of course, am very pleased, very proud of San Shen. He is one of just a few people who have taken the step of uh, lay ordination, which is what this shawl, brown shawl, represents. And that has created for us a very special uh, relationship, a very special connection, in which uh, we have what is uh, in, uh, in Chinese called Yuan, or in Japanese, En, which means we have a karmic uh, affiliation that transcends any understanding that either of us might have about our relationship. And we just have faith in that. We just trust that. Uh, that means practically that I have a certain special responsibility for his path, uh, both in terms of his uh, mundane well-being. Uh, is he getting food? Does he have shelter? And also his spiritual uh, progress. How is he working with challenges, uh, making use of opportunities? And uh, when he goes, we won't have anyone else who has been through that process living here now. There are a number of people living in different places, but uh, this particular kind of relationship will have to transcend space, have to transcend location. Uh, so, Sanchen, uh, in this special connection, uh, I'd like to say that I'm very proud of everything you've done, everything that you've brought to us, and everything that you're taking with you. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great honor to be with you, and it's been uh, fun as well. So, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to hear a little bit about what brought you here to begin, in the beginning of your path, uh, with us and uh, any intentions you had in your training here. Hmm. There's a number of different ways I could answer that. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about a few right out there, just 10 minutes ago. <laughs> number of different starting points. Looking back at who I was when I applied to join here in 2016, I felt very trapped in a number of ways. Trapped in the conditions I was in, trying to do this or that and not having the willpower or the skills. Uh, or really the integrity to follow through or do what I wanted to do. I think that I did have pretty good intentions. And would just get in the way of myself fulfilling any of those intentions. Um, when I was 19, I began a political campaign uh, for to become a village trustee in the town I grew up in outside of Chicago, Fox River Grove. There, uh, it's a town of less than 5,000 people, and there is a redevelopment project uh, undergoing uh, in which the, the project was a quarter billion dollar project, so a $250 million redevelopment project in this town of less than 5,000 people. And it could or could have been 
great, could have been excellent for Fox River Grove, for my hometown. Uh, people have been trying to uh, bring commerce, economic activity to the downtown area for decades. And it seemed like anything would be better than nothing. Uh, but the developer and the village would have to use eminent domain to um, effectively seize 47 families' homes at fair market value, uh, give them to the developer to begin that process. And I knew most of those families. And, of course, a lot of people were uh, devastated by that. Um, and I thought I could help not only with what was happening there, but um, help build something that showed what a nice town could be what it would be like if people could be in community together and, uh, in a positive way. Uh, there's a lot of questions I wanted to ask about the development process and I felt like the only way I could do any of that was by gaining power. Um, I really felt like I had the right ideas and solutions for things. Um, and a couple times would bring this to the local governments and was even offered a position on the Planning and Economic Development Commission when I was 19. And I, I turned it down because I was too good for that as a 19 year old. <laughs> that's, that's way below me. This absurd egotistical, well, I don't have power or get paid, why would I do that? Mm. Is it this, this really interesting <laughs> mixture of good intentions and selfishness, mm. greed, um, trying to ascend to power for a variety of reasons. And I was very, I, I had thought so many elements of this so far through and so set uh, on my approach and some of the ideas I had I was beginning this campaign had absolutely no idea what I was doing just turned 20 didn't know how to ask for help so was doing this completely by myself um, didn't know how to effectively communicate with people or effectively organize or actually put aside my own selfish or my own just interests in getting power and being well known to actually work with people or people for the betterment of everyone involved. One prime example of sort of where I was with having uh, big dreams, good intentions, and the utter inability to actualize them is uh, I, I gathered enough petition, uh, signatures on a petition to be on the ballot. I was excited about that, and I told my brother about that. He was like, oh, you're really doing it. You're really, really running for village board. You're going to be in control of the village budget. We all live here and you're going to be in control of the village budget. And uh, your, your room's dirty. You can't clean your room. You can't keep your room clean and you're trying to be in control of an entire village. Do you see how absurd that is? Like try to get an internship or like volunteer or help with them or do something? And I was just so like, no, 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 you are absolutely wrong. I have good ideas and I could do this. And just this, I remember this strong gripping defensiveness and inability to say, 
Yeah. That's that's exactly correct. You're that is a really good point. I should really examine where I am with that. Um, Did that in any way bring you into the training? Was that part of what brought you into this training? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had been interested in uh, personal development and meditation uh, for a while before then, since in high school, reading books of Thich Nhat Hanh and other teachers, and would periodically go to uh, this place called the Blue Lotus Temple, uh, saw interesting imaging studies saying meditation is good for the brain, 10 minutes a day changes the brain in positive ways, and would tell everybody about how excellent meditation was, why everyone should do it all the time, always and would go to a temple to meditate for 30 minutes twice a week, <laughs> telling everyone they should really meditate at least 10 minutes each day. Uh, and was okay with that hypocrisy. I was like, I'm saying something true, I'm not demonstrating, but it was a clear example of do as I say, not as I do. And I didn't see that much of an issue with it at the time. Um, so just to draw it more to the training, and um, it was always so tough to for me to begin uh, meditating, to set up the conditions to allow me to meditate. I would have to plan certain logistical things to be able to get to the temple or set up a space in a certain way. And uh, it reminds me of this lovely sign on the front of this gym called Edge Fitness in Cary, Illinois, that I used to go to, where on the front of the door, it said, uh, you just did the hard part, we'll take it from here. It was small group classes. And it really was my experience that it took as much effort as I had to show up and then to be in that container and have those people lead me through um, whatever the exercises was, was uh, incredibly valuable. I, I keep coming back to the, to the phrase, uh, if you can't be disciplined, be clever. So setting up conditions to, um, in a sense, force yourself to do what you kind of know you should do. And I, that's been a common theme in my experience, in my time here, in my time before here. Um, but to just go back a little bit to that campaign, uh, I was freshly out of high school, I was kind of going to community, community college, kind of not uh, working at this, uh, this catering restaurant and trying to do kind of as little work as possible and oh, I'm just going to attain power, everyone's going to think I'm the greatest and then I'll be able, you know, to become president, rule the world, make everything how I want it to be and uh, won't really have to do much work, I'll be perfect. That, that actually was, not explicitly, but kind of the sense I was operating on, I believe. Um, and I... Uh, frequently partook in exogenous cannabinoid supplementation, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, some of the kids might call it uh, smoking weed. <laughs> so, we got that. Yeah. Uh, so I was into that at that age, yeah. Uh, so I would put on, I would wear these really fresh uh, suits and go to these political meetings and put on this complete front of being this polished professional um, diligence uh, yeah exactly this polished politician and then go home and kind of just lazily smoke weed and um, and I could say, oh, but Barack Obama and Bill Clinton did it, and 
you know, could come up with an infinite amount of justifications for it, but, uh, you know, it cuts out on my work ethic and, um, it's, it's good, it's good in general to not break laws. <laughs> it's a good general thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was um, consuming cannabis at a uh, park with some friends while running for a political office. Uh, a, a couple of police officers did not approve of that. They weren't very supportive of my choice. Uh, and I and we were arrested and my, uh, I wasn't committed, I wasn't breaking any laws at the time. I didn't have any paraphernalia or contraband on my person. And so, uh, I thought I was completely absolved. The quote from the police officer was, well, since this contraband is no one's, as you claim, it's now everyone's. There are these blanket charges. And four months before the election, or thereabouts, my face was plastered in all the local news media and on the papers that get delivered to my schools and all my neighbors. Uh, local trustee candidate faces drug charges. One of the papers put my great campaign photo. The other one put my... Uh, yeah, mugshot. Uh, so it was a landslide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, more or less, my ego was completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most painful things I had experienced to that point. Uh, particularly as I had um, gone through the process up to that point of not knowing how to and certainly not asking anyone for help, assistance, support, etc. And having just such this discrepancy between what I claimed I was doing and what I was actually doing, how I wanted to show up in the world, how I was actually showing up in the world, what was the distinction of being outside of my house in a polished suit or by myself being sloppy and lazy or whatever. Um, so there I was, again, feeling trapped and was just thinking that I needed to get out of there and um, I was looking for a sort of escape but had also kind of fantasized about becoming a Buddhist monk since high school. It's uh, If there was some sort of Buddhist monk union that put out pamphlets, the pictures would look really serene, It'd be very compelling. Mm -hmm. My idea of what a Buddhist monk's life was like, it's very picturesque and <sighs> I wanted to do that. So I uh, did the summer program at Great Bow Zen Monastery in Klatskanai, Oregon. Uh, and the, the schedule and uh, some of the influences are quite similar to the training that we do. I don't know if you could speak on that a little bit. Well, sure. We only have about five minutes left. Wow. And I do want to talk a little bit about your training here. <clears throat> so maybe I'll talk about those similarities some other time. Great. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that you mentioned was a, a distinction between our outer presentation and our inner state. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I've seen you do uh, over the past... Uh, well, since, since you came uh, uh, over this past training period is work on integrity and bringing the inner state uh, you're cleaning up your room yes making sure that your inner state is also uh, uh, beautiful uh, and in fact that was what you stated your intention was and and taking this ordination, uh, this lay ordination, trying to find a way to purify your own karma. Uh, could you tell us at all about 
your experience with that? Which part? The purification of your inner state. What's that like? Is that serene as you suspected? Mm -hmm. Is that easy and quick? It is very difficult to continually continually examine all of the ugly, negative, selfish, harmful parts of myself and just continually, continually coming back to it and continually being uh, humbled and it's day to day, I don't see that much of a difference, but week to week, month to month, it's incredibly worth it. Let me ask you this, maybe the most important question that you can answer. Why is it worth it? Hmm. What makes it worth it? Why not? Keep, why is it worth all the trouble of having integrity? It fundamentally shifts and improves. I'll say this for myself. It has fundamentally shifted and improved my life at every level, at the deepest levels. Uh, and it shows up in every single moment, every single situation. <coughs> it's starting with and improving the, the fundamental whatever core there is that travels it's the easiest way to change the world or the most effective way to change the world seems like the opposite of the way you first tried that's exactly correct <laughs> I tr yeah I tried to get power and, and top down mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's like nature, plants don't grow from the sky downward. Mm -hmm. um, Got to get dirty till the soil. Mm -hmm. Some other gardening metaphors probably fit. Mm -hmm. Well, you've gotten dirty. The, one of the things that we discussed out in the garden <coughs> was a time when, in order to <coughs> stay with the talk that I was giving, you didn't leave, you were just, you were sick, and you just threw up right <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes it is dirty, sometimes it is hard. Um, it seems that you said it's worth it because it makes, it impacts the world in a more positive way. Has there been any joy in it on, in, in your own experience? Is there a joy, a satisfaction, a fulfillment in this path of purification and integrity? I feel like uh, a motivational speaker that I would have hated in middle school when I say living an ethical life is really fulfilling, really rewarding. Mm -hmm. and it's something you can come back to. It's when you review your past actions and it makes you feel good, there's something very deeply intrinsically rewarding about that. I really believe in that now and part of me is like, uh. in the past I would have been baffled and appalled by that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, me too. I found that irritating when people would talk that way. Also. Uh, so, um, so we just have a few minutes. So here we are. I can say that you have been exemplary in uh, fulfilling your commitments and in coming to this point of, of departure in a way that everyone can be pleased with, happy with. Uh, it does happen sometimes that as people come to leave, I've noticed that they can be quite conflicted about that. And uh, when you have an inner conflict, one of the easiest things to do to work that out is to create an outer conflict. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people work hard to leave in a fight because then they don't have to worry about whether they should have left because now they have to leave. Uh, so it makes it sort of easier. But you've been strong in uh, following through in your commitments, on uh, working with the structure 
of, this, of the training that you've put yourself into, uh, leaving at a time that's beneficial for yourself and others, and being sure that your responsibilities have been carefully passed on mm -hmm. so that the community can, can flourish. Uh, <coughs> Why? Once again, why, why were you uh, so careful? Why were you so compassionate? Why were you so... Uh, uh, why did you have such a broad view as you moved through this process? Hmm. I I I deeply and desperately um, love what's happening here and <laughs> seeing how it's fundamentally uh, transformed my life and then people I interact with. Um, so deeply wanting that to uh, be more widely available um, is, is part of it. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's another sort of part, I, I used to play basketball, so it doesn't matter how well the first three quarters went, mm -hmm. but the sort of finishing strong aspect. And mm -hmm. when I think of past jobs or places or relationships, it's much easier to leave if someone's wrong. Mm -hmm. It For some reason, it feels like for any sort of change, especially uh, a departure to occur, it ha somebody needs to be wrong in that it can't just be uh, I don't know, but there's that inclination and if you can stamp that label on someone it clears up a lot of a lot of things. Mm. And it was love for what we're doing and for the community that allowed you to... But to be blunt, there have been times in your life when you might have tended to do that. Am I right? So something made it possible for that to shift. And, it, and what I'm hearing is that a love for the community, for the training, for the path, <coughs> uh, broke that pattern in you, but it's a pattern, in fact, that we all find. Mm. Is that correct? No, it is, uh, it is inspiring, and you are taking that with you. You're not only leaving in a good way, but you're leaving in a way that's, uh, that's guiding you to continuing to serve the world. Uh, which I just wanted to say to everyone, because I don't see this as, as an ending, as you say, it's a transition, and a good transition. Uh, well... It's about time to start into the meditation, uh, and I believe you'll be leading the first half hour and I'll lead the second half hour, if you'd like. Uh, <clears throat> are there any final thoughts you'd like to give us? Uh, we had a lot of stories we wanted to tell about our work in the woods together and fasting. And all kinds of things that we didn't quite get to, but um, but I did hear you say that that if there was one while we were out there, if there was one message you want everyone to hear, it's that transformation is possible. You and what you've said that you've already demonstrated that. But is there anything else you'd like to add to that, or should we just move into the meditation? It's actually possible to transform. 
to improve, to evolve in a, in a positive way, it's actually possible to change the world, to improve the world, to improve ourselves, to change ourselves. Uh, it's actually possible. I, I, I did not believe that for the longest time. And it can be hard, and it can hurt, and it's more worth it to do that than anything else I've ever experienced. But and both everything to do this to make this sort of transformation is simultaneously available right here, right now, within ourselves. Um, how we relate to ourselves, how we understand um, uh, as teacher Bhante Sujatha says, we're sitting on the toolbox, <laughs> sort of sitting on the toolbox to change and improve our lives and it's possible both completely within ourselves and in every single moment, in every single interaction, every single day. I, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. well, I'm proud to. I'm proud to have been someone who uh, you were willing to let push you to experience the pain, the difficulty that you mentioned, uh, to get to the point when you could say what you just said. Uh, we all can say those words, and. Their significance depends on whether we have lived them. Mm. So thank you for throwing yourself into that. Mm. It's been a great honor and pleasure to, <clears throat> to watch you strive and rejoice and sometimes strive and despair. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, both have, both are, are different kinds of steps on the path. Uh, so, if you wouldn't, if it's not asking too much, please, out of compassion, take us through a practice on that path. Feel free to take any position that's comfortable. Just gonna be seated, lying down, standing up. Whatever feels good to you. to set the stage some preliminary instructions from the ground up uh, just feeling our feet and having them uh, on the ground in a, in a stable way so they're stable but we don't have to use effort to keep them that way. And a sort of triangle with our knees and hips. And can feel around uh, for a position that is stable and relaxed. It can be helpful to have the hips above the knees. 
difficult to do it in chair, but chairs work just fine. Can tuck the lower back a little bit. Ground the tailbone down. So this is a point from which the rest of our body can spring upward with energy, with openness. And have again open uh, chests and a tucked chin to keep the spine aligned. A very common cue is imagining a string from the top of the head. You can also think of your head as a wheel, just slightly rotating it forward. And with this uh, stability of the posture from the ground up, we can relax from the top downwards. So releasing any unnecessary tension in the face, around the eyes, the cheeks, mouth. Drop the jaw a little bit if it feels good. And if you can notice the relaxation, the restfulness that this induces, feel free to cultivate that or play around with that even more. Again, relaxing from the top downward on this stable posture we've built we can relax our neck and shoulders chest relaxing our back and seeing if it's possible to breathe in a way that cultivates both relaxation and energy. It can be helpful to breathe from the core for an energetic breath that's full and also relaxing. Typically, we breathe through one of two sorts of points. It can be just chest, it can be just stomach, it can be some of both. Feel free to place your hand on your stomach and uh, chest if it helps you feel where you're breathing from. Opera singers can hold incredibly long notes after inhaling without their shoulders moving at all. So you can feel free to do whatever's comfortable with your hands. You put them on your knees or in your lap. As we stay with this breath, both cultivating energy and relaxation, maybe take a quick snapshot. Are we the same exact way that we were before this meditation started? Have we changed in any way? Has there been more energy, more relaxation. Even just the effort 
the intention to cultivate such positive traits is a change in itself, is a step in the right direction. It's a powerful step. As we pay attention to, as we focus on, as we are, bring our awareness to our breath, to the process of breathing, we can start to more clearly be in touch with the experience of being alive, with our life energy, with our life force, whatever, whatever you want to call it. this breath, will always be with us from the moment we're born to the moment we pass away. Something that's always with us, something that is always changing. As we continually bring our awareness to this breath, to the experience of breathing, continue to touch this moment of being alive. As we have our awareness on the breath, on our experience of breathing, we'll get distracted. Our attention will waver. We can be pulled by auditory or visual thoughts, sights, sounds of the world around us. There's any number of things that could pull us away from this, this very experience of breathing. But as we come back, as we 
notice that we're elsewhere and look again. This ability strengthened. This ability is improved. This is a very important aspect of being able to change, improve ourselves, a situation, the world. This step of being able to place our awareness on what's actually happening. Each and every time we come back to this moment, come back to this breath, it's a victory. We'd score bonus points if it were a video game. There's something incredibly positive about what's happening with that. We can, we can thank ourselves, we can reward ourselves, we can take the view we can create a positive mental talk that you know we're, we're really doing this. We're really doing this practice, doing this training. We're really trying to touch, trying to feel, trying to sense this moment of being alive. In our lives we can get confused anxious, scared, distracted, can tighten up and breathe from high up. And so very frequently for me, at least, that does not feel good. And to be able to see that there's this refuge, this oasis, within ourselves is incredible. There's this powerful, nourishing, strong, safe, relaxing core of our being that's always present, it's always there, and always changing, always different. We can use our breath, our breathing, to change how we feel, how we think. And so much can happen just by breathing deeply or breathing intentionally. Or breathing with curiosity or appreciation, or an investigation of what's this experience of being alive like.
can see that this is always here. It's always the same. It's always changing. We can use our breathing to be more relaxed. We can use our breathing to be more energetic. There's no conflict between any of these things. This is a practice. We can get distracted and come back, or at least have the intention to want to come back, or want to want to come back. A lot happens with that. It may not seem like it, but a lot happens with that. We build our concentration power. We can begin to see what's happening more clearly. change our brains in positive ways. Something that a few decades ago was unthinkable. As we sit here, as we try to remain still, this is just creating really good practice conditions. As we cut down on distractions, it's just an ideal way to build these skills. And another step of this is to do this in motion. So for the next three or four minutes or so, we'll have an opportunity to breathe in motion. Maybe there's a way to link the breath with our motion. Exhaling or inhaling with each step. So feel free to use this time to get water or use the restroom. Investigate.
breathing, the breath, in motion.
as <coughs> Sanshin has <coughs> gracefully and carefully explained to us, transformation is possible. That transformation, <clears throat> if it's based on integrity, transforms ourselves and the world. This integrity means that we're willing to clean up our own room. One way to approach our own room is to observe our bodies. As we move through our days, to observe our bodies means to observe our actions. What are we doing in the world? We bear witness to what we're truly doing. We're witnesses. We observe, honestly, our daily actions. We don't pretend that they are what they aren't. We don't pretend that they aren't what they are. As we sit in meditation, however, this integrity means that we feel what we're feeling. We feel exactly what we're feeling. Right now, without missing it by thinking about it. So at this time, feel. Feel what you're feeling right now. Feel what you're feeling right now. Stay with it, observe it, experience it. Witness it.
Integrity <coughs> means that we're willing to feel what we're feeling. Insight means that we realize that whatever we're feeling, the bird is still singing. And so we're willing to feel what we're feeling. If we're inhaling, we're willing to feel the inhale. If we're exhaling, we're willing to feel the exhale. If we have an itch or a pain, we're willing to feel that itch or pain. If we're at peace or happy, we're willing to feel peace or happiness. We're willing to feel what we're feeling right now without escaping from it by thinking about it.
As Sanshin has said, <coughs> transformation is possible. As he said, it's possible through integrity. Through cultivating integrity, we transform. We don't only transform ourselves, we transform the world. And why is that? He's also spoken of humility. And we humbly acknowledge that the vast majority of human behavior is an attempt to avoid feeling what we're feeling. Especially the big decisions. We take in order to avoid feeling something that we're feeling. We're willing to do this even if it causes harm. We change the world by practicing. Practicing. Becoming willing to feel what we're feeling. In this way our actions are no longer motivated by the desire to avoid and therefore they become motivated by compassion. Which is simply put the opposite of avoidance. As he has seen and shown again and again, our patterns are strong, we escape from them and fall back in again. And escape again and fall back in again. So if you're finding yourself descending back into thought, thinking about what you're feeling, thinking about other things, take courage. Be inspired by his example and try again. To return to your body. Feel what you're feeling <clears throat> without any story about it. Feel this moment as it is. completely.
this is a time for any reports or questions or conversation about anything mentioned. Over the years, I've heard any number of residents uh, in great quandaries of whether they should leave um, the monastery over the period of months, even years. And I get the email about the sit uh, just a couple of days ago stating, you're out of here. Uh, now I realize I'm not a resident, and I also realize you're a very silent person. However, can you perhaps give a little of the catalyst that led you to this decision and over how long you said, time to go. That's an inappropriate question. I'll take it elsewhere. Uh, most of my life for the past decade, 15 years or so, a lot of what's happened is me trying to do something and then having, say, the universe just slam the door in my face, just, no, you're not going to do that in very painful ways. Um, and so with coming here, here was this doorway, this opportunity, this For me coming here, there was no doubt, um, just something to step into. And in a somewhat similar fashion, um, opening or opportunity was presented to me, and I had a similar sense where uh, it's not the sort of thing I would have come up with, but yeah, here we go. Um, it's been about three months, maybe a little more since I've no, I'm not. So you're saying a new gig has come up for you, ready to uh, attend to, having completed this one? What is the opportunity? Right. Without going into this. Well, hmm. I want to. But I do see it as a continuation of what it is that I have been doing. Um, I'd love to speak about it uh, kind of offline as it were, but um, it's putting my efforts and life energy into um, probably, probably the most mission aligned place with this place, and I see tremendous benefit in um, collaborating organizations and paths being drawn uh, I used to think that I could conquer the world by myself. And then I tried to do, I tried to actually do anything. I don't know if you've tried to do anything, but in my experience, it's surprisingly hard. Uh, so, but I've seen what can be accomplished by groups of people, and in fact, groups of groups of people. And um, so 
So I've been interested in how can I continually practice on improving, transforming myself and the broader world and um, finding a way to examine reality, whatever that is. Um, and I see my next step as a way to continue with that while opening up to more people. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll read about it in the future. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> it's been great uh, I, I'm watching you come in and uh, I certainly do identify when you were telling us about how uh, you judge yourself you, at, at one point, you judge yourself by your intentions, which were all good, and the world was cruelly judging you by your actions, which maybe weren't so good. Yeah. I did a lot of that. I know, I, know, I know what that's about. And I, I got to say, <clears throat> from what I'm observing, I see an individual uh, that is taking action. I think that uh, wherever you go, you'll find yourself in service and bringing your practice with you. And you know, what more is there? So, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. When you were talking about your when you were your younger years, I got the sense that you were awfully hard on yourself. I just wanted to say that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But I think it's wonderful you've found this path that you've found, and that you're hopefully finding your way with peace and happiness. But I just noticed that you, that you seem to be awfully hard on yourself. What? When you were talking about your younger years and, you know, your selfishness and things like that, and just... I don't know, because yeah. many young people are, most young people have, have a lot of those traits, and so, mm -hmm. but I am very glad you found that path, the path that you're on. Yeah, that's been, uh, there have been at least one or multiple retreats when almost the sole focus was how do I change the relationship with the mental talk in my mind? How do I change that relationship so it's not, uh, you know, in my experience, uh, an angry drill sergeant in my mind, but a relationship with my inner talk that is actually beneficial. And it's I certainly don't want you to make, be any harder on yourself than you already <laughs> are, but, yeah. but that's just, anyway, you seem like a, I, I think you're a pretty wonderful person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm getting better at saying thank you. It's like that. <laughs> I just sort of, sort of was thinking of the thing that you're presenting about integrity, and like as you were talking about it earlier, uh, it seemed to bring to mind some of the sort of questions and paradoxes, or maybe sometimes experienced paradoxes that come up in making decisions from integrity in, in everyday life, and I'm, I'm sure that comes up equally in a monastic setting as in other settings too. So by everyday life, I mean all everyday life, but um, the, um, the, the, the sort of thought I had is, is it's like 
I find in a broader sense there's this sort of idea of integrity and then there's doing integrity and the idea of integrity is is often easy to look at in isolation and then the doing of integrity involves a sort of discernment because intellectually all situations are really hyper complex if you're honest about it I think you know and that doesn't mean they really are as a decision making <coughs> thing but there's like some sort of there's some sort of challenge and in intuition and devotional aspect to to that that I think that in a way those challenges you're talking about touch on and I'm just you know I don't have any very precise question or feedback on it other than that but but it's something that I've been really working with and thinking about in my own life um, in that like I m my sense is the world is constantly pushing putting pressure, making a passive least resistance towards a kind of a little bit of a pull off of, of at least how I view integrity. And um, so it's, it's just a challenging, interesting path that you're talking about. And I, I really wish you a lot of luck and hope, hope that um, you all be sort of mutually supportive in this process of actually doing that. Can you talk a little bit more about the, you mentioned the phrase, the path of least resistance? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, I, find, I find that often when I work jobs, I've worked jobs with um, employers that I think can have varying levels of integrity in their, in their operations. Um, and at this point, I feel like I have an honest job that I'm doing useful stuff with um, and can provide a service in what I'm doing. But, but, but I, notice, I notice there's all these sort of little things about, let's say, how the business world is constructed that I think probably generally in the business world there's an expectation of too high levels of marginal profit, for example and that leads to over-marketing of a service, for example, or like the temptation to apply excessive glamour to something um, <laughs> in order to hook someone into it. But, but it's like that cycle of glamour in both like business, politics, um, even spiritual beliefs or other kinds of things are all things that we to some degree have to interact with because our our society like often requires it to do anything and if you if you fight it too hard you literally can't move or do anything unless you have some extraordinary level of of determination or enlightenment or something so there's an honesty that goes in my experience with saying well I'm really Am I doing the best I can? Am I really doing the best I can? What's the best I can do? Let me try to do this. And sort of cycling through that over time with a sort of devotion to seeking spiritual truth and service. Um, but it's, it, it, it's made at least less ideal as a path than it could be by a society that, that isn't necessarily broadly and explicitly devoted to that as such. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. I think all of that is very well said. I would point out one word, uh, ideal. It's maybe not the ideal way to move forward, I believe you said, with consistently examining, is this the best way to do this? Have I done this the best way? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you were saying it would be 
easier in our current society to not uh, have that process occur. Is that what you were alluding to? I'm saying it's easier. It's easier to to try to find an easy way out of the thing that's like maybe I got a little more out of something in the sort of immediate sort of reinforcing. Like let's say I make a little more money because I make a sale, but I sort of distort something to a customer a little bit extra or something or you know so there's a path of least resistance because it does take a lot lot of work like. Um, I had a situation in a previous thing where I was um, accused of something that inappropriately and so I decided to really properly go through the process of a hearing and not agree that I did something that I didn't do, for example, or that kind of thing. So the, the integrity, there's an integrity to it, but there's a real challenging to it and, and those Thing, things can just take an extraordinary degree of energy to, to go against the stream. Even when the stream m might throw you over a waterfall if you're not careful and you might be crushed. So, like, welcome to capitalism. <laughs> I think you've done a good job of demonstrating this, actually. I think that <clears throat> these points are not only well seen, but well said. Uh, I expect that many people in the room have gone through this kind of soul-searching that you're describing. Um, and you've said it very well. Uh, acknowledging the importance of being somewhat idealistic and acknowledging the importance of not getting too caught on that or else we can't do much at all. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, seen and Sanshin has uh, demonstrated that with his decisions uh, over these years. Uh, Sanshin certainly has some idealism stuck in there and uh, quite a bit of realism. Uh, the desire to, to get things done in a good way. Uh, <clears throat> and it's very difficult to, uh, to bring these together. A, a prior comment was made about being hard on ourselves. Uh, uh, they say in Buddhism, that a person, a, a true practitioner of the path, is a person who is not superior to anyone, is not inferior to anyone, and is not equal to anyone. <coughs> and uh, a lot of the time when we uh, <coughs> speak badly to ourselves, it seems as if what's happening is that we're talking down to ourselves. But one of the subtle uh, benefits, one of the clever tricks that we get to play on ourselves when we talk down to ourselves, is that we're subtly confirming that I am above that person to whom I'm speaking down. Yes? <laughs> so, I'm speaking down to myself. So I'm saying, you're so stupid. But the person who's saying, you, me, are so stupid, isn't so stupid. I'm clever. I'm the clever one who knows that you are stupid. Uh, <clears throat> does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, so there's, we, we create this dual me, the me who's talking down to me. So I did something wrong, and then I make up a me who gets to be above me, talking down to me saying, you did something bad, but I know that. I'm the one who knows how you should have behaved, you stupid person. Which indicates that I'm clever. Does that make sense? 
the me talking to the me above me watching me deciding if I'm right is superior to me versus me who's inferior. But this is also me. And so we get to take both of these positions of being both superior and inferior to ourselves. It's very strange. And, it's in, a, and in an even more mysterious way, it's extremely satisfying. We get a lot of, of fulfillment out of this. Uh, and my proof that we do is, is very simple. We just keep doing it. <laughs> and people do stuff they like doing. So there's this enjoyment we get out of it. But however enjoy, enjoying it is, However, enjoy, enjoy, enjoyness it is. However, enjoy it is. It's not nearly as fulfilling or, or as enjoyable as as not creating that wound in our hearts, not creating that division in our hearts, and finding a way to bring these together. Uh, so, we, so in that way, we find this point of of harmony within. And that's something that Sanchen has, as he said, spent weeks and months on. Uh, so compassion for ourselves. You could say compassion for ourselves, yes. You could say compassion for ourselves. So there's no longer a me above me watching me deciding if I'm right. Okay. We have compassion for ourselves, and we find a sense of harmony within. Uh, and in that way, we become equal to, uh, to ourselves, you could say. We become one person. This is an incredible achievement. We can work on this for weeks and months, as Sanjin has done, and, and have a hard time achieving it. And then achieve it, and then suddenly find a minute later that we're back in talking down to ourselves. How did that happen? I don't know. Okay, time for a few more weeks and months. Uh, and we can do that. Uh, so the first thing I'd say is that that work is really hard and really makes a difference. We, we can think it doesn't really matter. It's weeks and months. I have a lot of better things to do with my weeks and months. This whole integrity thing, I don't know if it's worth it. Well, it's worth it. Uh, that's the first thing I'd say. It's worth it because then you're happier, and it's worth it because you make the world better. However, even this point of harmony isn't the final point. Because even that has to be dropped so that we can function in the world. It's amazing. There's something beyond even that. Uh, we reach this point of clean cleanliness and purity within. And then we go back into the mess. And being willing to go back into the mess is even more profound than that state of purity and fulfillment. Uh, so I appreciate that you bring this up, because uh, compassion for ourselves leads to compassion for the world, and that means that we're not even equal anymore. We don't know what's going on. We, don't, we have no rank whatsoever. Not better, not worse, and not equal. It's a mess. Going. Yeah, exactly. We just keep going. Here we go. Let's do this. And that's what Sanjin has done day after day, week after week, year after year, and most important, moment after moment. We have about a minute left. Shall we finish there? Do you have any, anything else? to me, um, the power that you carry in a good way, what I, 
what I saw when I met you was an extremely high amount of focus um, and determination and discipline. And there's a confidence now, not a false confidence, just a confidence, a, a really good, powerful, in a good way, confidence. And it's really exciting to see what you're going to go out and do in the world with all the work that you've put into yourself. So anyway, I'm really glad that we had a chance to, to meet a little bit. Well, we, uh, <clears throat> when people come, we say, welcome. No, well, go. Well, go. Okay. <laughs> and the relationship isn't, uh, isn't going anywhere, even if you are.